Welcome to the Rediscovery channel. This is the channel where I and my good friend Stilgar, uh, we each try to surprise each other by coming up with a topic from history that the other guy hasn't heard of. So most of the time it happens that way that uh, the other person doesn't really know anything about uh, the topic. So my name is Ivor Kovac and mm -hmm. today um, I have somebody that you probably haven't heard about, but you may have heard of some things surrounding this guy. Um, so I'm going to ask, have you heard of Yazdegerd III? I don't think so, but it sounds familiar. Can you tell me a bit more about him? Yeah, you might have heard about him and forgotten his name. So if I say Shah Yazdegerd III, you automatically will know which part of the world he's from, right? Yeah, so from uh, Iran, I guess, from Persia. Yeah. Persia. Mm -hmm. He's actually the last of the Sassanid uh, emperors, the Sassanid rulers. And actually, you know, you say Shah, and most people think of that Muhammad Reza guy from the, the 1900s. But um, back then, they actually would be called the Shah and Shah, which means king of kings. So they had, you know, some good pretentious titles. But actually, you know, King of Kings, Shan Shan, I'm wondering if that might not have been part of the inspiration for Prester John, you know, kind of subliminally putting it in there in the people's subconscious mind as a concept. But at any rate, uh, Yazdegerd, his name translates as uh, made by God. And he ruled from 631 to 651 AD, and he is the last of the uh, the Shahs, the last of the Persian rulers before they got conquered by Islam. So, if you recall, um, you know we talked before about the Persian Byzantine War, right? Mm -hmm. Which it it was the war that weakened both empires so badly that the Muslims who were previously contained were able to come out and basically just spread all through North Africa and the Middle East. So before, you know, Yazdegerd, it's, you know, just to keep him in context, I got to say something about the Sassanid uh, Byzantine War, or the, the last Persian Byzantine War. Because actually, you know, the, the Persians and the Romans had been fighting on and off for a long time. And it may have been due to uh, Thucydides' trap sort of thing where uh, you have two great empires, they're bound to fight. Um, but also, also it, it's kind of like um, they would be the two greatest threats to each other, technically. It's like if you have two lions in um, the jungle and the lion is the most powerful predator around, obviously the greatest threat to one lion is going to be the other lion. So what ends up happening is they focus on each other and they fight and fight and they maul each other really badly. But all the while they're fighting, there's a jackal that's off in the corner. And of course the jackal is a scavenger and normally he's not a threat to the lion. The lion would just smash his head off. But after the lions fight and they damage each other, well, now the jackal can do something. And maybe he can kill the lions now that they're weakened or and then the age of the lion is over and the age of the jackal begins. Yeah, so, or hyenas, right? They actually do that. Um, like they'll attack lions, but they they're very, they outnumbered. Like they try to at first they you know call in for backup and then they just overrun the lions and that's how they. But anyway. Yeah, that's what <laughs> happened. So yeah. you had uh, Khosrow, uh, the 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 last Persian Byzantine War ran from 602 to 628 AD. And Heraclius was the Byzantine emperor. And Khosrow II was the Persian emperor. And um, I believe Khosrow was actually the aggressor. And they really took a huge chunk out of the Byzantine empire. They, they even came close to Constantinople, but Heraclius was able to turn it around and he cut straight into their territory, you know, towards uh, eventually he just decided not to worry about 
uh, defense and just went for offense. And when uh, the Persians started losing uh, badly, then uh, they killed. They kind of took it out on Khosrow because Heraclius he he told them, you know, I don't want to fight anymore. Let's make peace. And uh, Khosrow, I guess he didn't respond right away. So his so they took him out. The, his own people did, and they set up his son uh, Kavad II as uh, the next Shah or Shah and Shah. But then uh, Kavad he dies within just like a few months. It's not even a year, and I'm not sure what caused him to die. Could have been anything. Um, but then there's a, an issue with succession, and you have all sorts of different people that want to take over. So on the one hand. There's a problem because so much of their army was killed fighting against the Romans. And, of course, the Romans also lost a lot of their army. And the war really accomplished nothing for either side because their borders were just returns to what they were previously. But now you've got a much smaller army and you've got damaged cities. So um, the Persians, they fight among themselves for a while, the nobility. And then they set up Yazdegerd III who is the grandson of um, Khosrow. So it goes Khosrow, then Kavad the second, then Yazdegerd the three. And the sources I was looking at, they, they said that uh, Yazdegerd was actually eight when he took over. But I don't, I find that hard to believe and they're not, you know, it's, it's impossible to be completely sure because he is the last of the of the rulers, the last of the Persian rulers, and when the Muslims take over, they burn uh, so much of the books and libraries that we don't have um, as much data on it as we as we should. So Yazdegerd III becomes the Shah on June first of six thirty two, um, and the Persian Byzantine War ended in six twenty eight. So at, right in the same year that uh, Yazdegerd b- becomes Shah, um, the, the Arabs, the Muslim Arabs, they decide now is our time. And they start to attack the Persian Empire. And in 636, the Persians lose the Battle of al or Qadassia. I'm not sure how to pronounce this, unfortunately. And I've Card- seen it- It's Kardashian, I think. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they took one with her and they and they lost their will to fight. Like, oh man, I gotta go home now. So, wow, uh, bad joke. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. My eyes. I don't mean my eyes in a good way, but okay. So, but actually, you know, um, uh, it seems like the Armenians, since you brought the Kardashians, they were kind of, they were one of the things that the Persians and byzantines were fighting over like who's going to control that territory and uh there were armenians kind of serving in both armies but um after the battle of al Qadesia and the persians the persians lose and they've already lost pretty badly and they're still hurting from the they're they, they're still hurting pretty bad from the persian byzantine war and then you know the civil wars after that which made things worse so now they, they lose this battle, and this battle is, ends up being uh, the point of no return from them, where after this, they're just going to keep losing, basically. Um, but after this battle, the Muslim caliph, and his name is Omar ibn al-Khattab, offers Yazdegerd the chance to surrender and convert to Islam. And I actually have copies of the letters that I wanted to read. I have it open here in one of the windows. Let's see if I can get it here. All right. So this is from Omar ibn al-Khattab, the, the, cal- the caliph of Muslims at the time. So he says, um, I do not, and this is written to Yazdegerd. He says, I do not foresee a good future for you and your nation, save your acceptance of my terms and your submission to me. There was a time when your country ruled half the world, but now see how your sun has set. On all fronts, your armies have been defeated, and your nation is condemned to extinction. I point out to you the path whereby you might escape this fate, 
namely that you begin worshiping the one God, the unique deity, the only God who created all that is. I bring you his message. Order your nation to cease the false worship of fire and join us that they may join the truth. Uh, let's go down a little bit here. Worship Allah, the creator of the world. Worship Allah and accept Islam as the path of salvation. End now your polytheistic ways and become Muslims that you may accept Allahu Akbar as your savior. This is the only way of securing your own survival and the peace of your Persians. You will do this if you know what is good for you and for your Persians. Submission is your only option. Allahu Akbar. Uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think I've read I've I've read this letter before. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. So it's yeah, I've, I've heard this before. I think I've heard the response as well. Um, yeah. It's it's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna um, the response next. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, no. You or, know what this letter sounds like to me? It sounds like you know, it reminds me of the Borg like we are the Borg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that's that's kind of like the at the the basic of the tenets of Islam is that at one point it will dominate the world and that the whole world will uh, submit. Um, in Islam, I think literally means submission. Um, so yeah, no, I, I get it. Um, it's an interesting uh, point. It's, I think it's also interesting because, um, but maybe you'll talk more about this later, because Iran or the Persians took very long to assimilate into, um, into the religion because yeah. they because they had such a strong cultural background. And that's like, uh, you know, the Greeks, like the Greeks invading, uh, Persia of Alexander the Great, um, they were able to defeat them militarily, but then the Greeks starting their own little kingdoms there, they just turned into Persians over time because the, the Persian culture was so strong and in many ways it was superior. Um, and I think Islam also had a very tough time changing the people in, in, the, in what used to be Persia as well. Um, and there is still resistance, I think, to this day, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but anyway, I don't want to take too much of what you're uh, going to talk about. But, yeah, yeah, and actually, since you brought up the Greeks, I'll just say quickly that, um, you know, a lot of people, they, they think that uh, Iranians, they kind of group them with Arabs, you know, regular people that are in the pop culture. They just assume that everybody from the Middle East is the same. And today... Um, you could say that, yeah, uh, the Iran is a bit more similar now to the Arab countries than it used to be, but it's not the same. And at this time, the culture gap was between the Greeks and the Persians is much, much smaller than the cultural gap between the Persians and the Muslims. Like the Persians, they were actually much more closely related to Europeans. And before they speak an Indo-European language and before the conquest of Islam, they would have been physically indistinguishable from Europeans for the most part. And it's kind of sad because uh, the Byzantines and the Persians, they actually had much more in common with one another than they did with many of the other groups in the areas, particularly like the barbarous outliers and steppe nomads and Arabs and such. But at um, any rate, let's... Yeah, but may other. maybe let's one one addition here when you speak of muslims at this point in time you're speaking of arabs yeah it's and and arabs. and it's not like arabs in nowadays like um you know like or or even later on in um in what is nowadays iraq um where they did like import a lot of cultured people from persia but also from uh from the christian world and uh built you know cultural institutions and uh over there but in the early stages and i'm guessing this is during the second caliphate um they were basically for to a large extent they were just bedouins right they just tribes people from yeah. from the desert so you know, yeah, they, they, most of them weren't able to read or write. Um, and they would have very little in common with, um, 
with a, an average Greek or an average Persian, for sure, they had much more in common because both the Greek and the Persian culture, they had, you know, philosophers, they had mathematicians, they had intellectuals, they had, you know, it's, it's vastly advanced cultures. Um, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's also a very big difference in um, a language and in values. Uh, but it's Semitic languages, they, they're a totally different language family. So, but let's uh, not get too much into the weeds because I want to read uh, the yeah. letter. From yeah, yesterday. yeah, go ahead. How he I responded. I could ramble on forever about uh, the different cultural things. But okay, so here is from it says, From the King of Kings, that'd be Shahan Shah, King of Persia and beyond, Shah of many kingdoms, Shahan Shah of Persian Empire. And this is his letter back to this guy, the Arab caliph. And yes, uh, back then, the Arabs, the Muslims were pretty much just Arabs. And we mean uh, like Arabs were pretty much confined to the Arabian Peninsula back then because they couldn't, before the Persian-Byzantine War, they could not really penetrate out of it because the either the Romans or the Persians would just slap them down. Um, okay, so here. In the, here's, his, here's what he says. In the name of Ahura Mazda, the creator of life and wisdom, in your letter you summon us Persians to your God, whom you call Allahu Akbar, and because of your barbarity and ignorance, without knowing who we are and whom we worship, you demand that we seek out your God and become worshippers of Allahu Akbar. How strange that you occupy the seat of the Arab Caliph, but are so ignorant as any desert roaming Arab, or sorry, you are, but are as ignorant as any desert roaming Arab. You admonish me to become monotheistic in faith. Ignorant man, for thousands of years we Persians have, in this land of culture and art, been monotheistic, and five times a day have we offered prayers to God's throne of oneness, while we laid the foundations of philanthropy and righteousness and kindness in this world, and held high the ensign of good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. You and your ancestors were desert wanderers who ate snakes and lizards and buried your innocent daughters alive. You Arabs who have no regard for God's creatures, who mercilessly put people to the sword, who mistreat your women, who attack caravans and are highway robbers, who commit murder, who kidnap women and spouses. How dare you presume to teach us? who are above these evils, to worship God. You tell me to cease the worship of fire and to worship God instead, to treat us, uh, sorry, to us Persians, the light of fire is reminiscent of the light of God. The radiance and the sun-like warmth of fire exuberates our hearts, and the pleasant warmth of it brings our hearts and spirits closer together that we may be philanthropic, kind, and considerate that gentleness and forgiveness may become our way of life, and that thereby the light of God may keep shining in our hearts. Uh, here we go. Our God is the great Ahura Mazda. Strange is this, that you have now decided to give God a name, and you, and you call God by the name Allahu Akbar. But we are nothing like you. We, in the name of Hura Mazda, practice compassion and love and goodness and righteousness and forgiveness and care for the dispossessed and the unfortunate. But you, in the name of Allah, but you, in the name of your Allahu Akbar, commit murder, create misery, and subject others to suffering. Tell me truly, who is to blame for your misdeeds? Your God, who orders genocide, plunder, and destruction? or you who do these things in God's name, or both. You who have spent all your days in brutality and barbarity have now come out of your desolate deserts, resolved to teach by the blade and by conquest the worship of God to a people who have for thousands of years been civilized and have relied on culture and knowledge and art as mighty edifices. What have you, in the name of your Allahu Akbar, taught these armies of Islam, besides destruction and pillage and murder, uh, that you now presume to summon others to your God? Today my people's fortunes have changed. Their armies, who were subjects of Ahura Mazda, have now been defeated by the Arab armies of Allahu Akbar, 
and they are being forced at the point of the sword to convert to the god by the name of Allahu Akbar, and are forced to offer God prayers five times a day, but now in Arabic, since apparently your Allahu Akbar only understands Arabic. I advise you to return... <laughs> Sorry. It's like... <coughs> uh, I, advi I advise you to return to your lizard-infested deserts. <laughs> Do not let loose upon your cities your cruel, barbarous Arabs, who are like rabid animals. Refrain from the murder of my people. Refrain from pillaging my people. Refrain from kidnapping our daughters in the name of your Allahu Akbar. Refrain from these crimes and evils. We Persians are a forgiving people, a kind and well-meaning people. Wherever we go, we sow the seeds of goodness, amity, and righteousness. And this is why we have the capacity to overlook the crimes and misdeeds of your Arabs. Stay in your desert with your Allahu Akbar and do not approach our cities. For horrid is your belief and brutish is your conduct. Signed, Yazdegerd III. So, yeah, it's kind of... Uh, and I did laugh there, but it's just like such over the top, uh, you know, it's, it's such over the top criticism of their culture. And it's, it, it's, interesting. yeah, but he did end up biting the dust. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Too. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like a, so what do you notice about this letter apart? I'm going to go ahead and you want to say anything about this? Uh, you want to comment on this letter at all? Yeah, I'll keep it short. I mean, you know, I, I get it. I mean, they're way more sophisticated. And uh, I think he has some he things, the things he points out make a lot of sense. Um, but, uh, you know, I think uh, he also hints at some things that, you know, that makes them weaker compared to their adversary. And, and I'm guessing that probably paid part of, you know, Played a big part in their in their downfall. Other than fighting the uh, the Eastern Roman Empire for all those years, and probably also I don't know if they had it. I think they did, having lots of fights over whoever took the throne. Right, that's also yeah. something that's weakened from within, uh, and something you might also recognize nowadays in uh, certain countries. Um, with politics where you know you have all this division and people fighting over who's taking over and um yeah and meanwhile there's this other power that's coming up and it's probably going to dominate this century and going to overtake the leading role and is that going to lead to a conflict as well so anyway super interesting uh, topic i think yeah yeah but, i yeah. also think that <clears throat> The future is dark, and I'm sure Yazdegerd the three, uh, the third was thinking the same thing. And uh, back in his time, he would be correct in that assumption. And uh, you know, one thing I noticed, like I'll, I'll, I've seen a lot of people. I mean, this this letter and talk of it is something that's kind of suppressed, you know, because it's not exactly what um, the uh, people of authority like to hear, but. Um, one thing I noticed reading this letter that really struck out at me is uh, he's talking from a position of pride, but not of strength, because no. he says, like, uh, don't come here and don't do this. But he doesn't really have any way to make it happen, you know, which I agree with uh, the general sentiment of his letter. I feel like he gets into he kind of skirts around uh, race a little bit, kind of not just criticizing their religion, but also criticizing their background, too. Um, especially where he talks about, like, they're, they're eating lizards and such like that. And I still see, like, Iranian nationalists, they'll say this about um, others. And when they criticize, um, you know, the surrounding countries, they, they also will mix up kind of race and culture, like, criticizing them on both grounds. But uh, what happens to Yazdegerd is he continues, his people continue to lose, and uh, they're pushed west. And in 637, the the Muslims, the Arabs, Muslims, they take uh, Stesiphon. And uh, later on, like a, a bit later, I think it's in 641, they actually burn the great library that's there. And it's kind of like when the same kind of thing as when they get in Egypt, 
Yeah, the guy, 642, they took Egypt. So one year later, pretty much. Yeah, and the, the guy, the, the Arab uh, general that's occupying, he says kind of the same thing He's to the caliph. He's like, oh, what should I do with this big library? And uh, the caliph says, oh, we don't need anything. We don't need any books, you know, but uh, the Quran. So just burn everything. And they actually kill a lot of um, the scholarly class of the Persians. They kill a lot of them. And they burn most of their libraries. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of these records are so sketchy and we're not sure how old Yazdegerd was um, from this time period because a lot of the history was lost and history of earlier periods. And uh, a lot of Iranians are killed and a lot of the most intelligent people are killed off, like uh, kind of like what Emperor Chen did with his scholars. The Muslims mm -hmm. do with the Persian scholars, and they, um, you know, it, it kind of a dark age follows. And a lot of the women, they chose to uh, resist, to violently, you know, take up arms and fight themselves as well, because <clears throat> it was preferable to just get killed in battle than to be taken as a wife by one of these guys. And Yazdegerd, um, he tries for the rest of his life, he tries to get help. To, to fight off the Arabs, but, uh, and he keeps having to fall back and fall back, and nobody really cares that much to help him. He tries to get help from Turks and from some of the other provincial governors, and he tries to get help from China. So I think, uh, yeah, he asks for help from China multiple times, and they don't respond. And then in 651, he's killed by a miller in the city of Merv and nobody's sure exactly why the guy killed him. Some people, they think he was a, a collaborator with the Muslims, but then others say he didn't know who, who um, <clears throat> Yazdegerd was and he just killed him for his jewelry. But Could again, be. we don't, we yeah. don't know. <clears throat> like, but the burning of the texts, um, that makes me think of also the, uh, Islamic conquest of Spain. It was the same thing. Uh, and women were also forced to um, to become more self uh, like independent because um, because times were so tough. So um, but yeah, anyway, interesting uh, interesting story. And uh, when um, uh, Omar, when he took uh, Egypt, uh, that was a major blow to the uh, Eastern Roman or the Byzantine Empire because that's where they got all of their grain from, pretty much. So then there was like a giant um, wave of hunger across the, the Byzantine Empire, followed by a plague, etc., you know, further weakening uh, the empire. But yeah, anyway. Yeah. The yeah. last, the last uh, Persian Byzantine War, like it's something, it, it's like a very, um, what, what, uh, the word I'm looking for, I can't find, but it's it's one of those major turning points in history where, uh, if it hadn't been done, you know, like if that war had not occurred, like if you could travel back in time and stop it, very good chance that we would still have the the original Persian Empire, although it'd be changed somewhat. And the, the Roman Empire both would have probably survived. I mean, they wouldn't have survived in their original forms, but, you know, the Arab Muslims would have remained contained. And had that happened, there would also be like a much bigger um, uh, Abyssinian uh, presence in Eastern Africa as well. You know, yeah. because one of the things that whittled that empire down was Muslims. They surrounded them. Well, and I mean, it's not uncommon that these like nomadic tribes because they are so mobile and so tough that they end up overtaking fast territories like it also happens with uh with the mongols um and yeah. the scythians right and and others in the in as well because they're just so good at what they do uh, and i don't know if the arabs if they rode horses or if they used camels but apparently yeah. they were extremely mobile right that was yeah, part of I, well, yeah they did use horses and uh that's one of the things i saw is they had like a light cavalry which could outmaneuver the heavy persian cataphracts but <clears throat> the persians had them under control up until 
they were devastated by this final war with the Byzantines. And same for the Byzantines, because they, they had tried to break out before. Mm-hmm. And like uh, he said, you know, they were attacking caravans and such. But after they had become this weak, they didn't have the manpower. And they really kind of ignored, you know, them and didn't consider them to be a threat. And that's probably why, uh, you know, they saw them as an inferior people who, oh, look, they don't build anything. Oh, look, they eat lizards. Oh, look, they they live in tents. But, you know, they, when they are getting the upper hand, he still couldn't bring himself to surrender. And I don't blame him for not surrendering. I would rather be dead than surrender to these guys. But, like, he he couldn't, he's still talking down at them, even though he's from the weaker position. Yeah. And, um, as far as, like, one thing I found out about China, like, which we mentioned before in an earlier video, uh, and I, I didn't finish um, looking into all this, but basically... Uh, Yazdegerd's son, he has a son named Peroz, who he continues the work of trying to approach uh, China for help. And um, eventually he is taken in by the, the Chinese along with his family and what's left of the Persian royal court, Peroz is. And they put uh, him in charge of like a Western unit to work for the Chinese emperor. Mm-hmm. But it's not until his son, who basically Perose's son, finally gets the Tang uh, emperor to help out the, um, the Persians. And their goal is to retake Persia and uh, for the Persian royal family and set them back in charge. But it never happens because like they're, the, everything is set up to do it. And okay, Narcier. Narcier is the son of Perose. So it's Yazdegerd's grandson who finally brings the help. And the, it was the Tang dynasty that's in charge of China at the time. And the Tang dynasty, they agree to like go with him to retake the homeland for the Persians. But what happens is while they're on their way, like uh, they get attacked by the Tibetans. And so the Chinese general... He stops to deal with the Tibetans, and uh, Narcia never gets. Oh, man, in. these freaking Tibet- Tibetans, man! Like <laughs> always, starting wars. <laughs> what well, is it with them, right? Well, actually, <laughs> uh, that's what you know. Like today, people think that Tibetans are just innocent victims for the most part, right? But they actually gave. <laughs> they actually fought with China. Uh, quite a bit in the past. Okay. I, am, uh, I have to admit, I know very little about uh, Tibetans, so <laughs> no. I just thought of nowadays, they're, you know, yeah, that's like their their logo, right? Although we don't talk about them as much anymore as we used to. Nowadays, we talk about uh, the Uyghurs more than the Tibetans, but yeah, anyway. Well, and actually, I found out something about that, too. Like their failure to help um, Narcier and mm-hmm. uh, Yazdegerd, be, like when they fail to go and um, follow up with this, m- the Muslims keep pressing west, and they come all the way up against you know the Tang Dynasty and the, the Uyghurs. And then this is the time that they convert to Islam. Yeah, so it ends up uh, hurting them as well. But yeah, yeah but so Tang, they should have helped him. Narcia. Probably, but you know, it's like a lot of short-sighted people, and um, yeah, and and these these, and I, you probably talk a little bit more about this because these nomads, like the Arabic nomads, they were extremely effective in their warfare, mm-hmm. and then they had this religion also that made them extremely determined. Right? Not only was there like the the laws around distributing of. Um, Boot, uh, what do you call it? Like the loot, or whatever they get, war like booty. yeah, war booty, and including women and children. But um, there was also this, this you know, like this if cult, like the the surest way to go to heaven, uh, almost similar to the Vikings, right? Is is if you were to die in battle, and and, and I don't know, because do you have that in there where he says the response about how they love? death as much as the Persians love life? Oh, uh, no. You know, I, for, I forgot uh, about that, actually. I do remember something. That, yeah, I remember hearing that before, but... 
Yeah, I came across oh, that, God. and and that's basically I think what was his response was that we lo- that we Arabs or Muslims love death as much as you Persians love life, which I think is a pretty strong comeback. Um, you know, to showcase how determined they are, and to, and it's like an extremely different way of uh, the way you look at life, completely different. It so. Is. And it will also and, and it's very hard to oppose that if you are somebody that's seeking wealth or pleasure or you know like culture or it's very hard to stand against that, I guess, right? So um, yeah, and also if you're if you're fighting those kind of soldiers on the battlefield, then they're gonna be far like far less likely to surrender. They're gonna fight down to the last man. Yeah, and they're going to do as much damage as they can to you. Yeah, because oftentimes, even like in these early battles, like the battle wouldn't be won because one army was completely destroyed. It was because one army would lose its nerves, and they would just uh, because too many of them started dying. Like the people, the, per, the guy next to you got stabbed in the heart. The other guy, the other guy on the other side of you gets like a. Uh, uh, an axe in the, in the eyebrow, you know, and you see all this blood and gore around you. I mean, these were very gory wars. Uh, people, you know, people would lose their nerves and at one point start running. Um, and then if you have these soldiers that really don't care and they, that are seeking death, you have a distinct advantage on the battlefield in that kind of situation. Yeah, they're going to just do as much damage as they can, you know, uh, to, in the process, and they're not going to be afraid to die if they truly believe that stuff. But yep. um, and they and they have a lot less to lose because it, it was true that the Arabian Peninsula. I mean, before they found oil, that wasn't really a wealthy place. That was a backward place, you know, technologically, uh, low population density, not much. You know, they, there's not a lot of wealth there, so uh, they don't have as much to lose and. I think also that the Persians were probably in shock. Like they couldn't believe that these people are all of a sudden, you know, taking us over like, ah, it's such a disgrace. It, it kind of like if you play a, you know, like you're playing a fighting game or something and then some kid comes and beats you like some six-year-old or five-year-old. Like, yeah. I can't believe I lost to a five-year-old, man. This is a five-year-old. It's like, I can't believe we're losing to these people. How can this happen? You know, this cannot be. But it is because you guys, I mean, it, it, again, like, they spent all of their energy, and not all, I mean, but they, they spent so much of their time fighting the Byzantines and a lot of destruction, a lot of people dead, cities damaged, but but no change in the borders. So they, So they were trying to take some territory from them, but... There was there was no change except that now we're weaker. But maybe even if they had avoided the the war of succession, they might they might have still been able to uh, put them off. But I, I don't know. But but yeah, it's a, they yeah. they didn't see them as a threat, and they just they, they didn't take them into account. I like what you said about people having more or less to lose. That's also kind of what happens to the Vikings. I'm going to throw my own episode in it <laughs> with Harald Hartrada. You said, why doesn't he give up? Why doesn't he say it's enough? I think if you live in that kind of society where death is just like all around you and you realize how short your life is and you're going to die probably sooner than later anyway, you might as well make the most out of it, right? And try to gain as much fortune and as, as you can. Um, so yeah, I'm guessing if you're coming from these, you know, desert territories and people usually don't live that long uh, compared to, you know, your Persian prince or, you know, you live a very comfortable life. As ironic as it might seem, you know, the one person is going to have a much harder time fighting for all the stuff uh, he has versus the other one because they have very little to lose. Yeah. And then yeah. also, I've also heard it said that, like, the more things you have, the more your things have you, or the more yeah. things you own, the more your things own you. But. <laughs> Yeah, which I mean, is I think... uh, which brings us back to Diogenes, anyway. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, interesting uh, 
That's and that's actually one of the things that the Greeks uh, used to say about the Persians is that they are too effeminate. Um, they would always had a they, beard. Would, they yeah. would always talk about how yeah no but you know they were like calling them girls or women because they weren't true men like the Greeks. Um, but yeah. <laughs> the Persians were saying the same thing, like, oh, look at these freaking Greeks. They shave their beards off. They look like women with short hair. <laughs> <laughs> Although Heraclius had a beard, and he wore, like, this big, tall helmet on his head. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, man. It was a cool story. I didn't know. Um, I mean, I knew about it. I knew some of it. But it's an oh. interesting, um, interesting uh, part, and it had such huge uh, implications for the rest of the world. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, this is such a disaster. Well, and then it's like somebody, you know, making a value statement. But like, actually, this time period, um, in case anybody doesn't know, this is how like the um, the Parsi community comes to be in India. Like, there's a lot of uh, Persians that uh, flee to the east, like you have a lot of Zoroastrians, they go to India, and then you have um, also Persians going into China, and you have Christians, uh, I think uh, there's a different denomination of Christianity, but they actually went to China, and they were allowed to set up churches there, and the Persian um, dynasty, the Sassanid dynasty, they end up just, like Narcia, even though he fails, he ends up being allowed to, uh, he, he ends up escaping, and he becomes an official in the Tang court. So he, he joins, like, they're kind of absorbed into the Tang uh, courtiers in China, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, you know, and it, it's, like, China is one of my favorite cultures, too. And I, the Tang is, is um, a dynasty that a lot of the Chinese nationalists and patriots talk about, you know, and... Um, I do want to look into it more because of that, but it's considered like the Tang Dynasty is considered to be a golden age for China, and uh, it was also even inspired Japan to some extent as well culturally. So, hmm. did yeah. not know that. Maybe we should do more about uh, the Tang Dynasty at some point. Yep. But yeah, hey, if we have any listeners from uh, Iran or maybe some of the neighboring countries, uh, drop a comment, let us know. Um, Cause I'd uh, love to le le learn more about this. Um, if it's safe, of course, I guess. Um, but yeah, would love to learn more about how modern day Iranians think about this. It's probably a mixed bag, I imagine. Um, they still call them lizard eaters and all kinds of uh, words, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of that still. I had a, a buddy from Lebanon um, who went to Turkey one time. He had a Turkish girlfriend. And they would say all kinds of racial slurs against him because he was Arab. So it's, yeah, there's a lot of ethnic stuff still there, uh, even though, you know, technically it's the same religion to some extent. Although um, in Iran, of course, they have the Shia religion, which is different. But um, for the most part, I believe. But yeah, no, I would love to also, because, you know, you had this this really strong culture there. And they did end up, uh, you know, being absolved into, into this new religion for the most part. I mean, you even had the Islamic Revolution. But you do hear about how Iran still has so many intellectuals and... Um, there are still elements in that society that are different because apparently it was quite cosmopolitan uh, up until the uh, the revolution when basically, um, you know, like the cleaning people and uh, the garbage men and the underclass took over um, and took over power. And I wonder where they are now because I imagine they've upped the... Uh, the whole game of re-indoctrinating people or re-educating people um, quite a bit, but so yeah. every every Iranian person I've ever met inevitably starts talking about how good it was when the Shah was there. Even people that were, you know, not born when he was there, they're like, "Oh man, the Shah was so good," and all this stuff. The Shah, they mean like uh, Mohammad Reza, but. Um, 
I think that, you know, one thing I know about the uh, why uh, Iranians were not Arabized, you know, because the Quran has to be only translate only read in Arabic. Like if you translate it to another language, it's they consider it to be a non canon. So it's only true scripture if it's in the original Arabic text. And the Arabic language is very, very different from uh, Farsi. So the other Semitic populations of the Middle East were much easier to assimilate because their language was already more similar to um, Arabic. They're already related. But the uh, Farsi was quite different. They adopted the Arabic text as their way of, of writing, but they didn't adopt the Arabic language, probably because the language barrier was too profound. Hmm. So in the in Iran, you know, it's usually only the religious caste that are very familiar with the Quran, like eating, breathing, and sleeping the Quran. The average person can't read it. And then they did have a uh, long culture, which was much older, and Muslims would do stuff like, oh, you can't celebrate Nowruz, the Persian New Year. Like, oh, what do you mean I can't celebrate Nowruz? And it is a very different culture. They're not really compatible. And because of that, <clears throat> they're it never took hold as fully as it did in other places. One of the reasons that uh, the Islamic revolution happened in the 20th century is because you had a bunch of, um, a bunch of uh, like uh, the, the socialist kind of people, college students and hippies that were, you know, mostly secular and atheist that actually teamed up with the Muslims because both groups had a problem with the Shah but for different reasons, they teamed up and then the Muslims took full charge when the Shah was was gone. And then they basically uh, put their boot down on the secular people. And today, if you go to Iran, um, they have like police making sure that the woman's hijab is adjusted properly and, and they have rigged elections, you know, like and, and the people don't, aren't allowed to own weapons either. So there's, there's really nothing they can do. And even though Iran has wrote, written, like in the past ancient Persia, they wrote one of the first human rights declarations, which I believe was called the Cyrus Cylinder. I think so. Um, they don't have anything like that today. They have uh, Sharia law. They have, they have a government which is um, a cultural minority. And they can't do anything about it because they're disarmed. Like I have a friend who uh, he sought refuge in the United States, well, uh, more of a friend of my wife, actually. But he um, some of his family members were executed by the regime. And after they executed them, they uh, billed his parents for the bullets. So when they decide to kill you, they bill your family for the cost. And uh, you're not a lot like dogs. You can get a dog there. But if uh, somebody who is a religious uh, Muslim is offended by it, then uh, they can call the police and the police will just come and and kill your dog. And that's another thing that happened to this guy. So it's important that the citizens are able to possess weapons because you can vote for any kind of regime and you can vote to give away your freedoms or team up with people who want to take away your freedoms, but once your freedoms are gone, it's very hard to get them back. And maybe you never get them back. So. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, I would agree to, to some extent to, to that. I think that was always the idea, although I'm not saying uh, I'm against the Second Amendment because I'm not, but um, I wonder how much uh, an AR rifle is going to help you against uh, an opponent who has drones, but... Um, well, but yeah, it'll help I, a lot more than a butter knife. <laughs> probably, yeah, but I don't know. Uh, at some point, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, interesting co country. I, I would like to learn more about it, and what I always see is, because I read a lot of the, or I, I used to read a lot of the Russian uh, authors, and when you go on Goodreads, which is kind of like a social media platform for uh, people who read books, um, a lot of the reviews on there are on the, these great Russian offers are actually in uh, 
Farsi, right? That's a, that's the language you have over there. Um, yes. So there's a lot of people in Iran or of Iranian descent that just love reading Tolstoy, that love reading Dostoevsky, that love reading Chekhov and, and all these other great writers, which to me shows that there's still a strong philosophical spirit um, within those people. At least that's what it looks like to me, because otherwise, why would you have so many of those reviews in, in Farsi compared to any other language? Um, so, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and another thing that's interesting about uh, classical Persia and Iranians in general is if you look at uh, like one of my favorite, you know, I have like probably thousands by now, over a thousand, I should say, but I got all these historical images saved on my computer. Like, um, you know, some people, they like to download pictures of dirty things. I like to download pictures of cataphracts and uh, foot soldiers and stuff like that. But um, I have, like, if you look at the Sassanid Persian um, costume, which is one of my favorite styles, like forever. I wish something like that had prevailed for instead of what we wear today. But the Sassanid Persian uh, uh, style of clothing is kind of similar to Russian. And the architecture uh, was a little bit similar, you know. And, and actually, like with Russia, the reason they developed those big pointy domes that look like Candyland is so that the snow would slide off of them instead of crushing them. But um, the, and, and I've also seen one other thing is that like Slavs and Iranians, they have the same Y chromosome. So it makes sense. You know, it, <clears throat> they probably diverged from one another in uh, the past. You know, they were similar kind of common origins. I'm um, getting into the weeds again, but. It, yeah. it makes sense that they would have, like, uh, to me, it makes sense that they would find common ground with, with Russians, because I think they're kind of the same, and uh, not the same, but similar. And there's a book I found out about in my research here called The Shahnameh, which we might want to check out. It's like the chronicle of the, um, the, the Persian uh, Shahs or the Shah and Shah, that, the Shah and Shahs that came before Islam. We might want to check out that book. Okay, you may want to drop that one in the description, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Sean and me, um, it looks like it could be cool. It looks like it's a mixture of probably myth and actual fact, but I have I don't know enough about it to say that yet. So, all right, man. Yeah, I think yeah. I've said more than enough. Uh, the, <laughs> I probably said said uh, too much actually, but that's fine. If anybody's still listening at this point, congratulations, and. Uh, you Leave win us, a prize. You win a prize. You made it to the end of this video, so you've won my respect. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. But right. leave a like. Well, I don't even care if people leave likes. But No, leave, I don't care. No, leave a comment. Leave, what you think? Yeah, 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 let us know us something you, interesting. Did I go too much into the weeds or not enough into the weeds? And um, you want, do you want our videos to be longer, shorter? Do you have uh, Recommendations. Uh, something you want us to address? Yeah. And so I say for me, the most important thing is comment and share. Yeah. If you, if you can share it with your grandma, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. Cause she's yeah. lonely and you know, she likes to listen to people talk and you should call her more often. And since you're not doing that, you might as well share this video. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, somebody's grandmother could be listening to our videos anyways. Yeah. So, and uh, and actually, grandmothers are really important too, just like history. But like, uh, if your mom is listening to our videos, then. Some